ಒನ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಮತ್ತು ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಸಂಯುಕ್ತ ಆಶ್ರಯದಲ್ಲಿ ನಡೀತಾ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಅರಿವಿನ ನೀರಿಗೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಸರಣಿಯ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತನೆಯ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ತಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ನಡುವೆ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅವರು ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅವರು ಯು ಕೆಯ ಲಂಡನ್ ಅವರು ಅವರು ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸರು ಮತ್ತು ಚರಿತ್ರಕಾರರು ರಾಯಲ್ ಲಂಡನ್ ನ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ರಾಯಲ್ ಏಷ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿಯ ಫೆಲೋ ಆಗಿ ಕೂಡ ಅವರು ಪ್ರಸಿದ್ಧರು ಆರ್ಟ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಆಗಿ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಭಾರತದ ಆರ್ಟ್ ಮತ್ತು ಆರ್ಕಿಟೆಕ್ಚರ್ ನ ವಿಷಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಪರಿಣಿತಿಯನ್ನ ಪಡೆದಂತಹ ಜನಿಭರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅವರು ಸದ್ಯ ಲಂಡನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿದ್ದು ತಮ್ಮ ಬರವಣಿಗೆಯನ್ನು ಮತ್ತು ಸಂಶೋಧನೆಯನ್ನು ನಡೆಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರ ವಿಶೇಷವಾದ ಆಸಕ್ತಿ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಓರಿಯಂಟಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ರಿಕನ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಸೋಹಾಸ್ ಲಂಡನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಿಂದ ಪಡೆದ ಮೇಲೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಆರ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆರ್ಕಿಟೆಕ್ಚರ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಪಡೆದ ಮೇಲೆ ಅವರು ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಲಂಡನ್ ನ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ಹದಿನಾಲ್ಕು ವರ್ಷಗಳ ಕಾಲ ಕ್ಯೂರೇಟರ್ ಆಗಿ ವಿಜುವಲ್ ಆರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ವಿಭಾಗದ ಕ್ಯೂರೇಟರ್ ಆಗಿ ಕಾರ್ಯನಿರ್ವಹಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೂಡ ಭಾರತದ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಆಫೀಸ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಕುರಿತು ತಮ್ಮ ವಿಶೇಷವಾದ ಪರಿಣಿತಿಯನ್ನು ಅವರು ಸಾಧಿಸಿಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಲಂಡನ್ನ ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರು ತಮ್ಮ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸಗಳನ್ನು ನೀಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಮತ್ತು ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಕಾಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ನ ಬಹುತೇಕ ವಸ್ತು ವಿಷಯಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ತಮ್ಮ ಪರಿಣಿತಿಯನ್ನು ಹೊಂದಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರ ಸದ್ಯದ ಸಂಶೋಧನೆ ಇರೋದು ಕಮಿಷನ್ಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಈಸ್ಟ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಕಂಪನಿ ಕಂಪನಿ ಅನ್ನುವ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ಈ ಕುರಿತ ಪ್ರಬಂಧ ಮತ್ತು ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಈ ವರ್ಷವೇ ರಾಯಲ್ ಏಷ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿಯ ಮೂಲಕ ಪ್ರಕಟಗೊಳ್ಳಿಕ್ಕಿದೆ ಅವರ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಅಧ್ಯಯನ ಆಸಕ್ತಿಗಳು ಹೀಗಿದೆ ಆರ್ಟ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸೌತ್ ಏಷ್ಯನ್ ಹಿ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲಿಸಮ್ ಜೈನಿಸಮ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಶಿಪ್ ಮತ್ತು ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ನ ಸಂಗತಿಗಳ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಮೂರರಲ್ಲಿ ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅವರು ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಅನ್ನ ದ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಿ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಸೌತ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಎನ್ನುವ ವಿಷಯದ ಕುರಿತಾಗಿ ಮುಗಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಪ್ರಕಟಿತ ಎರಡು ಕೃತಿಗಳು ಹೀಗಿದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಮೂರರಲ್ಲಿ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಿ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಸೌತ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಶಪ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ಶಿಪ್ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಕೃತಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಟೈಲರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫ್ರಾನ್ಸಿಸ್ ಪ್ರಕಾಶನ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಅದು ಈಗಾಗಲೇ ಉಲ್ಲೇಖಿತ ಆದ ಹಾಗೆ ಅವರ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಬಂಧ ಎರಡನೇ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಆದ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಆದಂತಹ ಇಲ್ಲಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ದ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಇನ್ವೆಸ್ಟಿಗೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಲಿನ್ ಮೆಕೆಂಜಿ ಒನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಏಟ್ ಫೋರ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ಏಟ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಒನ್ ಅನ್ನುವ ಕೃತಿ ಅದನ್ನ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಆಕ್ಸ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಅದನ್ನ ಪ್ರಕಟ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಸೊ ಇದಿಷ್ಟು ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅವರ ಸಣ್ಣ ಕಿರುಪರಿಚಯ ಬಹುಶಃ ಭಾರತದ ಕಲೋನಿಯಲ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ನ ಅನೇಕ ಆಯಾಮಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪರ್ಟೈಸಿ ಅನ್ನ ಹೊಂದಿರತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅನ್ನ ಈ ಮೂರು ವೇದಿಕೆಗಳ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಮತ್ತು ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಹಾಗೂ ನೆರೆದಿರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಎಲ್ಲ ಕೇಳುಗ ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಾನು ಅವರನ್ನ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕವಾಗಿ ಸ್ವಾಗತಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೇನೆ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಜೆನಿಫರ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಫೋರಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಶನ್ and for inviting me here today to give this talk to you um to the uh Bengaluru Historians Society i'm going to try to share my powerpoint presentation now
my research shows that these women who became the charges of the East India Company after the murder of Tipu Sultan at the Battle of Shurangapatnam had an important role in fomenting the events that led to the Vellore Mutiny in 1806. The article reevaluates the context and the causes of the Vellore Mutiny by exploring accounts of the women's internment by the East India Company. Before the Fourth Mysore War, the women of Sri Rangapatnam Palace lived inside a fully functioning pre-colonial court. Their transferal from Tipu Sultan's inner court to the East India Company happened swiftly and they continued to conduct themselves according to the customs of their previous lives under Tipu's authority. Colonial accounts of the women generally focus on the vexation of British officials when the women behaved in unexpected ways. The British had no understanding of the women's roles at court, and as will be seen, they severely underestimated what they were capable of doing. These accounts of their unexpected behavior highlight the arenas that fell under their control and show how they use these seemingly insignificant domestic powers to deal with their new colonial masters. It's unsurprising that the women of Tipu's court have gone unmentioned in published accounts of the Valor mutiny. For over 200 years, the roles of these hundreds of women in, colonial, uh, in fomenting the mutiny have gone unnoticed in spite of the numerous references to their actions in colonial archives. By viewing the accounts of Tipu's female entourage as more than simple anecdotes of female misbehavior, new causes of the Valor mutiny come to the foreground. Right, I'm going to go to my next slide now. Hold on. Ah, there we are. Okay, so my article is based on research that I've conducted in archives in the United Kingdom. And the two main archives that I've consulted are represented in these two pictures. So on the left hand side, you have a picture of East India House uh, in the city of London, which was the headquarters of the uh, trading company, the East India Company. And in the East India Company's headquarters, East India House, uh, the the records uh, of, of the company's happenings uh, were stored in their library. This building was torn down in 1863 uh, and the records that were kept in its library are now in the British Library in London. Uh, the other picture on the right hand side is of uh, Arthur Wellesley who became the first Duke of Wellington but before he became the Duke of Wellington, uh, he was based in India and he was put in charge of Sri Rangapatnam Island after the fourth Mysore war. And his, uh, the uh, personal co correspondence of Arthur Wellesley is now stored in the Wellington archives at the University of Southampton, which is about an hour south of London by train. So I spent a lot of time in, in their reading room. On the 3rd of May, 1799, the East India Company's army killed Tipu Sultan of Mysore during the siege of Sri, Sri Rangapatnam, bringing the fourth Mysore war to an end. 
and to eliminate any chances of a rebel uprising taking control of Mysore, the company swiftly dismantled Tipu Sultan's court. Richard Colley Wellesley, who appears on the right-hand side of this slide, the Governor General at Fort William, placed his younger brother, Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, in charge of Shurangapatnam Island, where Tipu's court was based. Many of the ministers who had served under Tipu Sultan were offered positions in the new Wodeyar court that the company set up on the 30th of June, 1799, when Krishna Raja Wodeyar III, a five-year-old boy, was placed on the throne of Mysore. The soldiers under Arthur Wellesley's command looted Shirangapatnam, transforming it from the affluent center of a wealthy kingdom into a squalid, desolate place. Objects that were seen as holding particular potency or value, such as Tipu Sultan's throne, pictured on the left, and the manuscripts from Tipu's library, were sent to Richard Wellesley in Kolkata as trophies. So um, in this next, next slide, we see the throne of Tipu Sultan that was sent to Government House Calcutta, and the picture of Richard Wellesley, the Governor General of Fort William during the Fourth Mysore War, who incidentally was also the man who built, or, uh, who built Government House Calcutta, uh, which is now, as we know, Raj Bhavan. And this portrait, interestingly enough, was displayed in the same room as the throne. All right, I'll move to the next slide. Now, I think everyone knows, this is probably one of the most famous objects that Richard Wellesley sent to London uh, that was from Tipu Sultan's court. Um, it's the uh, automaton music box known as Tipu's Tiger. You can see there's a uh, brass handle on the side of it, which you crank up. And then the tiger, it, it rears back and lunges down upon the body of this, this chap who then uh, you can see there's a pipe sticking out of his mouth and he emits this terrible sound. Um, when it was sent to London, it was first displayed inside of East India House. And now it is inside the Victoria and Albert Museum. And these pictures I, I actually took in the Victoria and Albert Museum to show you how it is displayed at the moment. And the next slide, this is quite interesting. These are uh, objects that were discovered in an attic in a house, which is actually about a, a 20 minute drive from where I'm speaking right now. Um, these are objects that were looted from Sri Rangapatnam and brought to Britain by uh, Major Thomas Hart. Uh, they were discovered two years ago and um, the people who now own the house, who discovered it, they, they auctioned them off. But um, it's, it shows what sort of things these soldiers brought back to Britain as trophies. Um, I also mentioned that there are uh, that there were lots of manuscripts. Uh, Tipu Sultan's private library was sent to the college at Fort William. Uh, there has been a lot of recent research about the manuscripts by Ursula Sims Williams and Joshua Ehrlich, which I would recommend looking at. Let's have the next slide. So having plundered Tipu Sultan's capital and placed a child on Mysore's throne, the East India Company then 
exiled Tipu Sultan's family, ensuring that his heirs no longer resided within the borders of Mysore Kingdom. Between 1799 and 1802, under Arthur Wellesley's command, the company's armies escorted these family members from Shurangapatnam to the fortress town of Valor in the company controlled territory of Madras Presidency. So um, I just want to uh, talk about the map, uh, this old map, map of uh, Shurangapatnam on this slide. I've put two circles, two red circles on it. The circle at the middle is of the Dari of Dalat Bagh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, which is now maintained by the Archaeological Survey of India. The other circle shows the location of the palace where all of these women lived. And it's quite an interesting location because you can see the the Kaveri River, it, it branches out and uh, surrounds Sri Rangapatnam Island and at the place where these two branches reconnect at this uh, confluence point, that is where the palace was. And the next slide. Uh, I, so this is an old colonial map showing in yellow, the Kingdom of Mysore and Madras Presidency in this uh, British imperial pink colour, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I've uh, underlined the locations of Sri Rangapatnam and Velour uh, just to impress upon you that the reason these family members were moved from Mysore Kingdom was because uh, the British didn't want an insurrection. They didn't want Tipu's family to seize control of Mysore Kingdom again. And so they were deliberately moved outside of Mysore Kingdom to Madras Presidency. Now at that time, Valor Fort was regarded as the strongest fortress in the south of India. And for that reason, it was chosen for uh, the residents of Tipu Sultan's family. The sons were moved to Vellore between 1799 and 1801, and they were installed, along with their entourages, inside pre-existing buildings inside of the fort. The older sons, who by now were young adults, with families of their own, were moved there in July 1799. And this included, uh, you may recall, after the Third Mysore War, uh, Charles Cornwallis took two uh, of, Sip of Tipu Sultan's sons hostage and brought them to Madras. Uh, those two sons were then brought to Vellore in uh, 1799 as, as young men. The the younger sons of Tipu Sultan, uh, who were still children, of course, they were moved to Valor in October 1801. And as we all know, Tipu Sultan's sons remained at Valor only until August of 1806, after the Valor mutiny. They were uh, partially blamed for what had happened and they were then sent to Kolkata. Now, getting back to the women of Tipu Sultan's court, it was in 1802 that the women of Sri Rangapatnam Palace were escorted in two groups along this 200 mile overland journey to Vellore Fort. And to accommodate them, the East India constructed, the East India Company constructed two new complexes of apartments inside of the fort to serve as their residences. And these were named, and actually still are named today, the Tipu Mahal and the Hyder Mahal. And the point of these two areas is that they mirrored 
the organization of the Zanana inside of the palace at Sri Rangapatnam, which unfortunately has, was torn down in the 19th century. But uh, I found accounts of it in the Wellington archives that, that talk about how, how the Zanana area was, was zoned. So uh, one half of the women uh, were from the female entourage of Hyder Ali, and the other half were from uh, Tipu's entourage. And the reason for this is that in 1782, when Hyder Ali died, Tipu Sultan took over his father's court. So the Hyder Mahal was inhabited by the mothers, stepmothers, and nursemaids of Tipu Sultan and his siblings. And then the women of the Tipu Mahal were then uh, Tipu Sultan's private entourage uh, and included the mothers of his children. Construction of these new Mahals in Valor Fort began in 1800. Lady Henrietta Clive, the wife of Edward Clive, who was the governor of Madras at that time, traveled to Valor and wrote in her diary that the new accommodation would be a huge improvement over their previous lodgings at Sri Rangapatnam. Inside the new buildings at Valor, she said that the women would have, and I quote, two apartments each besides a veranda, which must appear magnificent to them after the confined space that they had been accustomed to live in. John Goldingham, the civil, civil engineer of Madras presidency, was placed in charge of building the Mahals of Valor Fort. And during that same period, between 1799 and 1803, John Goldingham was also rebuilding Government House Madras for Edward Clive and Lady Henrietta. So, um, right, in this slide, you can see uh, an old map of Velour Fort. And the Haram area, I, I put in my, my own uh, typeface where the Hyder Mahal and the Tipu Mahal uh, are located. And, and this zoning, these names still exist uh, today. I understand that the, the half called the Hyder Mahal is, is now in disrepair, you can't go into it. But the Tipu Mahal is still being used today. It was a prison until recently, but now it uh, has been converted into accommodation for policemen. Uh, it's uh, part of a uh, Tamil Nadu State Police Training Center. And uh, so you can see in these slides on the right hand side what it what it looks like today um, as a, a, a residence. Now this next slide is of some paintings uh, that were made at Valor in around 1830, which are now in the British Library. And um, they show people engaged in different trades and occupations and people of different ranks as well. Transporting key members of Tipu's family to Valor facilitated an exodus of thousands of Mysorean citizens. Some of them were from other branches of Tipu Sultan's family. So for example, uh, the, uh, the adult daughters of Tipu Sultan and their families, uh, they moved to Valor to be close to their mothers and brothers. But most of the people who moved from Mysore to Valor uh, would have been people who simply earned a living by offering services and goods to Tipu Sultan's court. 
A report written in August 1806 claimed that 1,812 servants and adherents of Tipu Sultan resided permanently in Valor's Peta area. That's the, the market area of the city immediately outside of uh, Valor Fort's entrance. In 1846, it was estimated that about 3,000 Mysoreans had followed the family of Tipu from Srirangapatnam to Valor. And a more recent study claims that around 6,000 Mysoreans moved to Valor in the early 19th century. So um, the dismantlement of Tipu's court was an act of control by the East India Company. It was the first time they'd done anything like this, so they didn't really have a clue what they were doing. Um, I have put in this picture showing the uh, portraits of Arthur Wellesley on the left and Richard Wellesley on the right, just to impress upon you uh, that these brothers were working together uh, to uh, improve or to, to strengthen uh, the uh, East India Company's hold over India. That Arthur Wellesley on the right, on, on the left rather, you can see he's wearing a cavalry uniform, he's holding a, a curved cavalry sword, and he's standing in front of a tent. In the distance, there's a Union Jack, and there are some soldiers moving a cannon. It looks like they're moving a cannon. So he represents the military side of the East India Company's operations. And then uh, the portrait of uh, Richard Wellesley on the right-hand side, he's wearing very uh, uh, ornate robes of state. He is sit he's standing inside of a building next to a desk that has scrolls and a quill pen on it. And there's a, a view through the window behind him of what, what one assumes is Kolkata. And so Richard Wellesley's portrait is the, uh, represents the administrative side of the East India Company's functions. And the two brothers were operating together. And these two portraits uh, were placed in the same proximity, in the same proximity inside of uh, Raj Bhavan, uh, of uh, Government House. Right, let's move back to these ladies. The earliest documentation about the women of Tipu Sultan's inner court is someone scribbling on my slide? The earliest documentation about the women of Tipu Sultan's inner court from the colonial archives uh, was written in June 1800 by Captain Thomas Marriott, the newly appointed assistant to the paymaster of stipends allotted for the support of the family of the late Tipu Sultan. Thomas Marriott was 27 years old when he arrived at Sri Rangapatnam. He'd already been in India for about 10 years and he was recognized by his superiors as being gifted with Indian languages. So for that reason, uh, he was uh, appointed to this post which required him to uh, uh, communicate with the ladies of uh, Tipu Sultan's court and basically to work out what to do with them. It, I find this quite humorous. I mean, honestly, what could possibly go wrong? You have one 27 year old man and over 600 women. It's, uh, it's a funny situation to imagine. Thomas Marriott's work at Sri Rangapatnam required him to directly communicate with the women in the palace. And the women, and I quote, in order that they may, might converse with Marriott, 
who had the whole arrangement of their affairs without a breach of Muslim propriety, adopted him into their family and consequently call him brother. So Thomas Marriott was an East India Company servant, first and foremost, but at the same time, he had been accepted into this complex courtly network made up of hundreds of women. And his first actions in this role were the subject of a report dated the 2nd of July, 1800. This report is quite long. I've, I'm only showing here two pages from the report. The report was addressed to Josiah Webb, the chief secretary to the government at Madras, and it recommended how best to organize the women's care. His diligence to this task makes it a really fascinating description of the inner workings of Tipu's female entourage. The report's key objective was to establish whether any of the women could be released back to their birth families and how best to care for those who would become the company's wards. So basically the East India Company wanted to get rid of as many of them as possible. They didn't know what to do with them. Marriott wrote, I have taken every opportunity of sounding the ideas and wishes of the women themselves. And through Marriott's discussions with these women, he learned that most of them came from local Hindu families and could no longer return to their childhood homes after living in a Muslim household. He also learned that some of the women were well educated and he requested that they, they write down their, their wishes. And this resulted in him receiving several voluminous responses. Marriott concluded that most of the women didn't have families beyond the walls of the palace that they could return to. And for those women who did, he felt that the number of applications to leave would be very few when they realized that on being released from the palace, they would forfeit all claims of maintenance from the East India Company. But nonetheless, by early 1802, before the move to Valor, Thomas Marriott had reduced their numbers from 601 to 345. So uh, the slide here is uh, two pages from Thomas Marriott's 1800 report about the women. And these lists are on the left-hand side is uh, for Tipu Sultan's Mahal and on the right, Hyder Ali's Mahal. And they describe the organization of the women in a pre-colonial court. And it's, it's similar to the arrangement of women in a Mughal court. Um, so the highest ranking women are uh, simply called the wives. And these are high status women who were married to uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu, or, or Tipu Sultan variously. Then below them, are uh, the first class courtiers. They're described as first class of unmarried women called Gain or Masratis for their accomplishments in playing, singing, etc. So, and I, I'm reading from the document right now. So they were uh, performance artists and they were these first class women there were 51 of them in total uh, in the Tipu Mahal, and they had 124 servants and slaves. These, this group of women were permitted to leave the palace uh, to perform to mixed male and female audiences, and they appear to correspond more or less with 
Mughal performers that were known as dominis. And their role was to publicly perform, uh, to sing and dance on behalf of the women of Tipu Sultan's entourage. And they would have played at festivals or important life cycle events, particularly weddings. The next on the list are the second class of unmarried women called Khan Kawas. I believe that's Persian, Khan Kawas. Um, and they were musicians and dancers who, uh, as it says on the document, uh, attended the Sultan in his visits to the Mahal. So they were musicians and dancers of a more personal nature. Uh, they were restricted to life uh, inside of the harem and they performed for the Sultan and for the other women of the palace, inside of the palace. And then below the second class of entertainers, you have uh, what, they, what he's called a hoodie wallies. And these were women who had uh, infrastructural role inside of the palace. They were cooks, seamstress seamstresses, nurses, teachers of writing and embroidery, messengers, dairy workers, guards, etc. They were the ones who kept the palace running. Now, Thomas Marriott, in this report, he didn't identify the women who lived in the palace by name, but in his later correspondence, he does identify a lot of these women in relation to their sons. So, oh wait, oh sorry, I forgot about this slide. This, uh, as you can see, it's a holy uh, festival uh, painting from Valor about 1730. And uh, I've put a blue circle in to show the, the part of the painting where you can clearly see these women who are uh, singers and dancers. Uh, so I've um, on the right hand side, I've uh, enlarged this area. So you can see them there. They're sort of holding this posture like this with their arms like this. And, um, and then on the left hand side, the lower left hand side, there's a picture of these uh, singers and dancers with some uh, musicians. And you can see they're doing the same thing with their, their arm. So they're right in there in, uh, during a holy festival. Right, now this is uh, getting back to Thomas Marriott identifying the women. Uh, he writes in his later reports about the women in relation to who their sons are. So for example, uh, these three portraits of Tipu's older sons uh, by Thomas Hickey, we know that the uh, the one on the left hand side is uh, he is the oldest son. Sorry, the oldest son of Tipu Sultan. He is uh, Fatih Hyder, and uh, he is the son of Raushani Begum, who was a dancer. Then the the son in the middle. Abdul Khalik, he was the son of Zafran Sahib, and she was a woman from Mysore. Uh, she was from a Hindu family who was taken into Tipu Sultan's court. And then the third son, uh, Muz Uddin, he was the son of Durdana Begum. And uh, She's quite interesting because uh, she was part, uh, she was one of a group of about 20 women who were purchased by Hyder Ali from Delhi uh, by an agent of Hyder Ali. And they were being, these 20 women were being sent to Mysore uh, at the time when Hyder Ali passed away. And so, Tipu Sultan then, he, he effectively became 
the purchaser of these 20 women. So you have a son who is, uh, he, his mother is a dancer. Then you have a son whose mother is a Hindu woman from Mysore. And then you have a son who, um, whose mother was effectively a, a slave. So, uh, but they were all uh, important sons to Tipu Sultan. Okay, now I'm going to get into the moving of the women to Valor. So in 1802, the construction of the new Mahals was nearing completion and it was arranged for the women to be transported from Sri Rangapatnam Palace to Valor Fort. The first group to leave were the older women of the Hyder Mahal, and they began their journey in May 1802. Then the younger women of the Tipu Mahal followed in June 1802. Thomas Marriott, who was tasked with reducing their numbers in advance of the move, wrote to Arthur Wellesley in March 1802 that out of the original 601 women, there were only 345 women to be transported. However, when the women of the Hyder Mahal departed from Shirangapatnam in early May 1802, Thomas Marriott, who was accompanying them on the journey, realized that there were far more women in the group than he had anticipated. What had happened? Although he had nearly half their numbers, he didn't realize until that moment that the remaining women, with the support of insiders such as Sri Rangapatnam's eunuchs, had brought new women into the palace to replace the ones that had left. And with the transport of the first group of women already in progress, Thomas Marriott sent a letter ahead of him to Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dallas. Thomas Dallas was the man who was in charge of receiving the women at Valor Fort in their new accommodation. So in Marriott's letter to Dallas, dated the 9th of May, 1802, he explains that there are 106 additional women in the Hyder Mahal and an estimated 100 more in the Tipu Mahal. And these women had been, and I quote, smuggled in, most of them without permission, and many of them by permission of officers holding temporary command. So the news reaches Thomas Dallas, and he was annoyed by this development and wrote back to Thomas Marriott that the new women should not be received at Valor Fort. And he, uh, he wrote, and I quote, Thomas Dallas wrote to Thomas Marriott, it is unreasonable that the company whose bounty has been so liberally extended to every branch of the families should be imposed on and saddled with an improper and unnecessary expense. I therefore think you had better, on the road down, mention the impossibility of my receiving into the Mahals here any but those who were originally belonging to the Mahals at Sri Rangapatnam, as the extra women must have been introduced without our knowledge as you were a man of great address and a favorite of the ladies, I trust you will have matters so arranged by your arrival here that there will exist no difficulties. Ha ha. Thomas Marriott had by now been working closely with the women for about two years. And he objected to Lieutenant Colonel Dallas's course of action. 
Marriott wrote back to Dallas in another letter that if any of the women from the Haider Mahal, newcomers or not, were turned away and sent back to Sri Rangapatnam, then they'd have a problem because the women of the Tipu Mahal, who were still at Sri Rangapatnam, would then refuse to depart for Valor. And the result would be the women being permanently split between the two locations. Half of them would still be in Mysore Kingdom and the other half would be in Madras Presidency. Marriott also told Dallas that it would be impossible to separate the women without using force and advise Dallas that, and I quote, the only way I see of getting rid of them, except by force, is to dismiss them from the Mahal whenever their mistresses die. So these men are faced with the unexpected prospect of failure at the hands of these women. Dallas conceded that it was easier to allow all of the women into Valor's new mahals. And he cascaded this information to Arthur Wellesley. He wrote to them, he wrote to, to Wellesley on the 12th of May, and I quote, I think they had better be allowed to remain as discharging them would awake dissatisfaction, which it may be as well to avoid. In total, 583 women were moved into the newly constructed Mahals of Lower Fort in 1802. When the move was nearly complete, Arthur Wellesley expressed his gratitude to Thomas Marriott in a letter that he expressively signed, believe me, yours most sincerely. The transport in 1802 was the first recorded moment when the women exerted their will on the East India Company. To the British men who were organizing their transport to Belor, such as Thomas Marriott, Thomas Dan uh, Dallas, and Arthur Wellesley, the women's actions were viewed as truculence rather than political maneuvering. And the incident, which we only know about today through the archived letters of Arthur Wellesley, was never recorded in the East India Company's records. The unexpected issues surrounding the women's relocation to Valor say a great deal about Thomas Marriott's unusual role. He was working for the East India Company, but he also had a duty of care to his adopted sisters. So over the next four years, from 1802 to 1806, the women lived peacefully inside the lower forts Mahals and their numbers continued to increase. Perhaps inadvertently, Thomas Marriott had sanctioned the continued introdu introduction of newcomers. And by early 1806, there were 790 individuals living inside the Mahals of Valor Fort. That's an increase of 207 individuals after the 1802 transport. It's an increase of over a third. Now amongst these 207 newcomers, there were 14 boys and 33 girls who had been adopted by the women. One of these girls was named Gulzeb, and she was the pupil and adopted daughter of Raushini Begum, the dancer who was also the mother of Fateh Haider, Tipu Sultan's oldest son. 
adoption of girls was a pretty common practice amongst professional dancers, suggesting that the women of the Mahals had continued between 1802 and 1806 as far as possible to conduct themselves in the manner that they had lived within Tipu Sultan's court at Sri Rangapatnam. But unfortunately, the increased numbers in the Mahals in Valor Fort caught the attention of William Cavendish Bentinck, the new governor of Madras. And on the 28th of February, 1806, Bentinck decreed that, and I quote, by the stipulation contained in the sixth article of the Partition Treaty of Mysore, we observe that the company have the power to reduce the sum appropriated for the maintenance and support of the families of the late Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. Bentinck ordered that all the inhabitants of the Mahals should have their allowances cut by between one third and one half. And the task of informing them of their reduced incomes and of choosing which women would be most affected by these cuts fell on the paymaster of stipends, Thomas Marriott. He was also instructed that from then onwards, he had to compile annual reports that showed the exact amounts they were being paid for their maintenance. So this next slide is, I'm sure you recognize the um, Fort Museum at Valor on the left. And then the top right slide shows a display inside of the Fort Museum of sepoy uniforms. And then below this is a, uh, one of these uh, drawings from Valor from around 1830 showing the Fort Adjutant's house, which as you can see is now the Fort Museum. William Bentinck's order to cut funding to the Mahals was issued five months before the Valor Mutiny. The cutbacks posed a threat to the women's way of life and catalyzed them into taking a stand against the East India Company. These domestic events have been overlooked in favor of military meetings of the Valor Mutiny's causes. On the 10th of July, 1806, between two and three o'clock in the morning, the military events of the Valor Mutiny began. Sepoys of the Madras Native Infantry killed 14 officers and 115 men from the company's 69th Regiment. The rebels took control of the fort and they raised the flag of the Mysore Sultanate, declaring Tipu's, second, uh, sec, Tip, Tipu's son, Fateh Haider, as their king. One officer escaped and raised the alarm at Arcot, the nearest company garrison to the Lore. A relief force was formed by Captain Robert Rollo Gillespie. And when they arrived at Valor, Gillespie gave orders to kill any sepoys that stood in their way. Nearly 350 men were killed and further executions followed at the hands of Gillespie and his relief force. Some mutineers were shot by firing squad, others were hanged and some were gruesomely blown apart after being strapped to the mouths of cannons. It was the largest sepoy uprising to precede 1857. 
The East India Company identified the Valor Mutiny's two main causes as resentment amongst the sepoys over a change in uniform and the residence of the family of the late Tipu Sultan at Valor. Investigations showed that a few weeks before the Valor Mutiny, the sepoys of the 4th Regiment of Native Infantry at Valor had refused to wear a new turban. Investigations into the headgear dispute in May and June 1806 were believed to be religiously motivated, even though the sepoys came from a broad range of religious backgrounds. Um, and I, I think this is a common thing with the British, that if something didn't make sense to them, they blamed the religious attitudes of people in India for, uh, for whatever, whatever it was that it, that it happened. It was a typical Orientalist response. Oh, it has to do with their religion. In the company's court proceedings into the mutiny's causes, there is plenty of evidence that the inhabitants of the lore were antagonizing the sepoys. The earliest report of discontent over the turban, gathered on the 10th of May, 1806, two months before the mutiny, recorded that two Havildars insisted that, and I quote, if they wore it, their caste would not supply them with water. And that they also were told that uh, these Havildars said that they would not be permitted to marry women from their community. Then a week later, on the 19th of May, similar complaints arose from sepoys claiming that their families would not let them live with them, or would they, I quote here, or would they prepare their rice for them should they wear the new turban? After the mutiny, a sepoy testified in court that similar threats were waged towards him by, and I quote, Tipu's people and the village people who would not continue them in their caste or give them rice or water or let them have their daughters in marriage if they wore the new turban. So it seems to me that these sepoys are being targeted by these threats, which are, they're not so much about religion, they're more about expulsion from their private homes. They're being banned from establishing new families. They're being told that, you know, no one's going to take care of you if you, if you do this. And the sepoys, they all were meant to wear the same hat. So, so they were pretty much all being, um, uh, being threatened with uh, domestic expulsion. The Court of Inquiry into the Mutiny's causes pinpointed the Mysorean community in the Petta district of Valor as stirring dissent amongst the sepoys. One claimed that the numerous Moor people of the Petta began to poison the minds of the troops by observing that such dress was very bad and improper. While another said that the thousands of adherents of Tipu's house assembled and uncontrolled in the populous Petta at Valor will ever furnish powers to disseminate the most destructive tales. And of course, the Petta was Valor's main public meeting place. Uh, it, it was also right next to the entr entrance to the fort. And it was where key members of Tipu Sultan's extended family lived, in particular, the, uh, the daughters of Tipu Sultan. Now, the Valor mutiny was preceded by a busy wedding season. Four of Tipu Sultan's daughters, all of whom lived in the Petta, 
were married in the early in early 1806. Omir Olnisa Begum was married on the 7th of February 1806. Fatima Begum was married on the 13th of March 1806, and Budi Olnisa Begum was married on the 8th of June 1806. And the fourth daughter, Nur Olnisa Begum, was in the midst of her wedding festivities when the Valor mutiny broke out. Her wedding party had begun on the 3rd of July, 1806. And on the evening of the 9th of July, mere hours before the mutiny began, a notch was being held as part of the continuing celebrations inside of the fort. And as part of those celebrations, 40 dancing girls from the Tipu Mahal were performing to the wedding guests that evening. A description of the evening of the 9th of July says that the performers represented Nur Ulnisa Begum's side of the family and that they were present until after the mutiny. All four of these weddings in early 1806 would have been huge community events that lasted for several days featuring, featuring singing and dance performances by the first class Gayan and Masrati women of the Mahals who effectively controlled the content of these performances in velour and, and so these performances, uh, they would not have been, their content would have not been understood by the British. So were these performers responsible for disseminating these destructive tales to the people of the Peta or to the, the broader Mysorean community at Valor? Were they all making fun of the Sikh boys' hats? In the court testimony of Thomas Marriott after the mutiny, he was asked how easy it was for the sons of Tipu Sultan to communicate with their family and servants in the Peta. The, the idea being that the sons of Tipu Sultan were partially responsible for the mutiny. Thomas Marriott's testimony reveals that it was difficult for the sons to communicate with those outside the fort. But the women in the Tipu and Hyder Mahals were in frequent communication with their daughters who lived in the Peta. The women inside the Mahals were fully aware of the sepoys' discontent in the midst of this busy wedding season when notch parties which were major social events, were regularly hosted inside the fort. According to one testimony, about a month before the mutiny broke out, the mother of Shukarullah was very earnest in recommending to Thomas Marriott not to enforce the wearing of the new turban by the sepoys. Then on the night of the mutiny, and I quote, a fire broke out on that part of the palace occupied by Tipu's women. Marriott went to the halls afterwards to make sure the women were safe. And the first thing the mother of Prince Shukurula claimed was, and I quote, Marriott Sahib, did not I tell you what would be the consequence of making the sepoys disaffected? So after the mutiny, Tipu Sultan's sons, as we know, were moved to Kolkata. The women who lived in the Mahals were now separated from their sons and their grandsons. And now they had to live under their reduced allowances as decreed by William Bentinck. However, 
they continued to protest against their living conditions. For example, in 1820, during the 18th year of their internment at Valor, the women completely broke the composure of Lieutenant John Jones, who by then was the paymaster of Stippens. In a report where he gives no information whatsoever about what triggered the incident, Jones wrote to the governor of Madras that the women of the Mahals demanded that their allowances be doubled so that they could live outside of the fort. And to force through their demands, and I quote here, without any cause whatever, these women were extremely outrageous. Now, I, I don't know what that means, but it sounds like they were behaving in a, a very, very unexpected way to uh, John Jones. And Jones demanded that the women who had quit the palace should simply have their allowances cut, you know, just get rid of them, forget about them. Now, the governor and council at Madras didn't agree, didn't agree with John Jones, and he immediately arranged for his removal from the post at Valor. John Jones was replaced by Major Augustus Andrews. And in July, 1820, Andrews reported that he had, and I quote, been able to appease the bickerings of all the classes of women that have for a considerable time existed in the palaces and indulge a hope that peace and quietness will pervade throughout the several classes. It seems to me that Augustus Andrews didn't realize that these, uh, uh, this discontent, these, these bickerings had been going on for um, a good 15 years. When Andrews was instructed to provide a census of the women, he was incapable of performing the task. He said that when he tried to do the census, the women invoked the names of Thomas Marriott and Arthur Wellesley, declaring that the East India Company had previously cared for them, and I quote, to the manner as observed in their own caste, and in a similar manner, they were formally treated by Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, and that they would rather sacrifice their lives than take part in his survey. Their protest was an attempt to regain the conditions of their treatment before 1806, which, according to the women, was when their roles under Tipu Sultan's regime were properly recognized by the East India Company. Now, this is a, uh, uh, a, um, a list of the inhabitants of the Tipu Mahal from 1823. So, uh, it took quite a while for them to get this, this report together. Um, and I've looked at it several times and it makes no sense. I think the women were just having the British on by this point. They were just saying whatever they wanted. To this day, accounts of the Valor Mutiny rarely mention the women of the Mahals. When they are mentioned, it's usually to describe their subordination under Tipu's rule. They were viewed as powerless onlookers who had lived under the authority of a despotic Muslim ruler. The earliest published accounts of the mutiny were written by William Cavendish Bentinck and Robert Rollo Gillespie. Both these men focus on the unfolding of military events and their accounts relate to their involvement with the mutiny. So in the case of Robert Rollo Gillespie, 
he led the relief force to Valor. So his account described the actions of the mutineers and the reaction of his forces. As for William Bentinck, his account was an open letter to the East India Company's directors in London. After the mutiny, he had been recalled. And so his, his account was a written protest of their decision to remove him from India because he was accused of contributing to the mutiny's causes. In the early 19th century, the British regarded women, the British, that it, they regarded women as having a marginal role in society. It uh, didn't matter if the women were Indian or British, that was just the British attitude. So the women residing inside Valor Fort were deemed insignificant to the mutiny's events. This attitude has followed all the way through to the present day with stories of women being conventionally sidelined as areas of specialist interest. And as supplementary to more established frameworks for political and social investigation. This prejudice explains why the women of Tipu's court have received virtually no attention from historians until now. However, the colonial archives that describe the actions of Tipu Sultan's female entourage under East India Company rule show that they wielded power in certain circumstances. And as a group, they were perfectly capable of exercising their will, both in the court of Tipu Sultan and then afterwards under the rule of their new colonial master, the East India Company. Now, I've just got a couple more slides to show. Now, I thought I would include this, uh, these are more of these uh, drawings from Valor from around 1830. Uh, the ones I showed previously have to do with, uh, uh, have less to do with the East India Company. Uh, these pictures all show uh, different aspects of the East India Company's operations at Valor. So you have the European man uh, in a palanquin, and you have uh, the, uh, the Fort Adjutant's house, which is now the uh, museum in Valor Fort. And then on the right hand side, we have um, this lineup of uh, assistants who worked in the Fort Adjutant's office and a lineup of uh, sepoys dressed in different uniforms. This is the last account I have found of the women of the uh, Mahals at Valor Fort. It's dated 1858. And it's an entry from a lady's diary. Uh, the lady in question is Charlotte Canning. And I've underlined the bit uh, that is relevant here where she says, there are still some Mysore Begums who reside in the fort and that a few cakes appeared at meals being little offerings from these people. Now, I would like to finish on this slide, just to say that I've been looking at colonial sources um, to investigate the lives of these women under East India Company control. Um, but obviously there are other sources, uh, non-colonial sources. For example, um, at Valor, I understand there are these uh, tombs uh, to the women who lived in the Mahals at Valor Fort. Um, uh, this, is, this is the big example that I've been able to think of that is, is clearly an important source of information about this very, very interesting courtly community and what happened to them under East India Company rule. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, uh, for a beautiful presentation.
Yeah, now uh, we take questions one by one. Uh, okay. First question from uh, Dr. T.P. Vijay. He's professor in Kannada University, Hampi. Uh, a question is like this. There were first, second, third, fourth, and fifth class women among them, according to a Tamil Nadu State Archives document dated 1835 of G.M. Stewart, commanding Bellur. May I know the difference between them, please? Uh, well, what, what date was Stuart's document? Was it later, sort of in the 1820s or 1830s? It's 1835 document. Okay, because I think the class, the British classification of the women changes and it gets more layered. Um, the original classifications that Marriott, that Thomas Marriott set out in 1800, I think are closer to what, what really, uh, how they were organized under Tipu Sultan. And then as, uh, as British um, control over the women continues over the following decades, it becomes more convoluted. That's what I think anyways. I can't hear anyone anymore. Is someone, uh, how, how, how do I answer these questions? Do I just? Hello? Someone moderating? Or? <clears throat> Hello, may I, may I ask one question, Jennifer, ma'am? Yes. Uh, Mama, I'm uh, Dr. Lalitam Bayanar, a Canada professor. Actually, I'm doing some research on the documents of Srimats, where uh, many women whose husbands have got uh, this uh, chelas, that is, uh, um, uh, they have become, uh, uh, be, they are basically uh, Hindus who have become chelas or made chelas. And after the death of Tipu Sultan, the women of those uh, uh, soldiers they wanted to go back to their homes and their uh, original uh, houses. So I have uh, 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 got some uh, uh, documents that uh, there in Sri Rangapatnam and also in uh, Coimbatore, uh, many types of uh, uh, protest has been happened where the Srimat of Sringeri and also the palace of Mysore, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Maharaj of Mysore, have taken this issue very seriously. Uh, one by name Kaveri, who was really uh, um, at her mother's home when uh, his father died. And before this Chela, becoming Chela only, he, she is in her mother's womb, it seems. Almost uh, five to six uh, documents are there, uh, which really shows the uh, conditions of women uh, who are really uh, got this, um, Dharma, Matantara, and other things. I want to ask you one question. Do you have any such type of documents about the soldiers who are really basically Hindus and become Muslims uh, after uh, becoming Chelas? What happened to those women after the death of Tipu Sultan? Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. And I'm afraid the answer is no, I, I haven't encountered these documents. Um, I, it's, it's really interesting for me, though, to hear what you're discovering um, from, uh, from where you, you are, um, that the East India Company's uh, records are, how should I put it, they're, they're appallingly businesslike. They're, they're really, they're, these people are bean counters who just want to make money and reduce costs and and so that's that's really what um, what I'm finding and I'm, I'm just trying to look for the the little details in the background that just happen to sneak through and things like the court testimonies from the um, the velour mutiny and such um, but uh, there's there's very little written about um, the sepoy soldiers themselves there's there's a little bit about the the British officers, but um, not much about 
sepoys. And of course, um, the records pertaining to Mysore Kingdom after 1800 are, are, are quite limited as well. They, um, they have to do more with um, the constraints that the company put around Mysore Kingdom, you know, that they were, they were basically extracting protection money out of them, weren't they? So there you go. Dr. Uh, Hans, may I? Yeah, question, uh, please, uh, Vageshir, madam, proceed with your question. Uh, Dr. House, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I have a small uh, clarification because by 19th century, the tradition of issuing inscriptions or epigraphs had already petered out. So are there any company records that tell us as to whose tomb uh, these are uh, in Velour? Because no. that there are inscriptions, but uh, we don't come across so many inscriptions by uh, 19th century. Um, you know, there, there is a decline. Yeah. Uh, so are, um, there are, oh, sorry, go on. No, no. Uh, are there company records at least by which we can come to know? I don't know. I found old, uh, you know, black and white photographs of the tombs and um, well, the, the photographs that I've put uh, on my final slide, um, you can zoom up on some of them. And one of them, there, there's a bit of a, there, there's something written on it about a, a Begum. But um, I've not seen them. I, I don't really know what's there, I'm afraid. But I, I hope to find out soon. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. House. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there is uh, another question by Ira. Do we have an idea from the EIC archives of the quantum of salary these women were paid when they were first moved to Verlour? Not really. They, they weren't keeping records of actual amounts until after 1806 and I've seen these documents before but I, I've not really looked at them in any detail they're they're if you like they they read a bit like laundry lists they're they're quite boring things you know that this kind of woman can have this amount of money to buy cloth and that kind of woman can have that amount of money to buy rice and they're I, I've yet to look at them uh, in any detail. But uh, the, yes, there question, are records there. A question, by, a question from uh, Nidin Olikara, Bengaluru. Uh, what are the larger contents of the Marriott papers? What kinds of information do they contain? Do they have the names of all, I mean, in bracket, not only the principal ones of Tipu's wives, mistresses, and where they came from? Um, no, Thomas Marriott's uh, relationship with the women, it really feels, um, uh, he, he wasn't really interested in generating lists of their names. I, I, I think that was something he maybe deliberately tried to avoid doing. Maybe, maybe he just didn't, wasn't interested. He just didn't want to do that sort of thing. But um, the Marriott, uh, the information about Thomas Marriott that I found is um, it's quite dispersed. So some of it is letters he wrote to men like Thomas Dallas and Arthur Wellington, which are in the Wellington archives in Southampton. And then some of it is entries in East India Company records. Um, and then there are private papers as well. So for example, I found a stash of letters uh, that were, um, written by Thomas Marriott's father, Randolph Marriott, who happened to be friends with Warren Hastings. And they were writing letters to each other discussing Thomas Marriott's career. Um, so I've, I've found out some information about Thomas Marriott that way as well. Um, but yeah, it just seemed to me that Thomas Marriott had a, a, a much more personal uh, relationship with the women than subsequent uh, uh, East India Company staff and 
that uh, he wasn't was not interested in doing what the East India Company wanted him to do. As a matter of fact, after the Valor mutiny, Thomas Marriott leaves Valor. He is the person who's uh, named to accompany the sons of Tipu Sultan to Calcutta. Um, and Thomas Marriott, when he leaves Valor, he puts his little brother, Charles Marriott, in charge of the ladies at Valor Fort. Uh, uh, question from Ananda Narayanappa. How come the Britishers have most of the documents related to the Indian colonial period that we, didn't, we Indians do not have? Well, that's a good question. Um, the simple answer is because um, the East India Company was a corporation based in London, and so the records were sent to their headquarters, which happened to be in London. Uh, which is, it's not, I agree, it's not, it's not fair. Uh, Professor Janaki Nair, uh, Madam, dropped a comment on uh, the earlier question uh, regarding the EIC archives of uh, the quantum salary of these women. Uh, that is in the form of, I think the question is about Tipu soldiers, not the EAC soldiers. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on it? Uh, oh, sorry, do I do I want to, or does yeah, Janaki yeah, Nair yeah. want to comment? Uh -huh. Janaki, madam, do you uh, want to intervene in, in, in this juncture? Yep. Hello. Sorry, so what, what was the question? Uh, she's, she, Janaki Mayor, Jan Nair Mayor just dropped a comment uh, regarding the earlier question. Uh, idea from the EIC archives of the quantum of the salary uh, these women were paid. Uh, Janaki okay, Madam is yeah. suggesting, she, uh, she's suggesting, I think the question is about Tipu soldiers, not the EIC soldiers. Okay, uh, right, right. Uh, that's all. Okay. okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. And thank you. Thank you, Janaki Nair, for your mice are more modern. I'm a great fan of your book. Okay. Uh, so next question is uh, uh, from uh, question from Ravi. Any records of these women marrying Englishmen like James Kirkpatrick did in Hyderabad or Victoria Gauramma in UK? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yes, James Kirkpatrick, made famous by William Dalrymple's White Moogles. I think that's what we're talking about. Um, um, I don't think so. Um, it, it seems to me that when uh, Tipu's, um, or when the, uh, the Mysoreans migrated to uh, Velour at the beginning of the 19th century, they um, they brought with them, uh, they, they kind of, they had it in the bag. They, there were so many of them that moved over that I don't think that a high status woman from, uh, uh, who is related to uh, Tipu Sultan in Velour would have married a, a British man. I, or if, if such a thing happened, I, I haven't, found it in the records. A question from uh, Padmaja Desai. Uh, she's asking uh, the direct participation of uh, Tipu's women in uh, Velour uh, mutiny. She's asking any reference for this. Um, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. Um, if you look at recent writings on uh, the Valor Mutiny, there you always encounter this same question, you know, was it the family of Tipu or was it the change in uniform which resulted in the Valor Mutiny? And this is what always seems to be debated. So I guess what I've just tried to do is take it a little bit beyond that and say, well, it's kind of both and that you know, I, I just, I refuse to believe 
that uh, a Sepoy uprising would be based entirely on disgruntlement over uniforms. I just don't think that men work that way. Um, <laughs> but if the men are being threatened, that they're that they're basically, you know, they're unworthy, that their, you know, their lives are going to be miserable if they continue in their jobs, which require them to wear a certain uniform, then that is probably grounds for them getting extremely angry and having a mutiny. And that's what you see in Velour. And, and it has to do with uh, the, the priorities of women and the, the, the women of Tipu's court, obviously they, they have, uh, they, they control certain networks of communication. Um, they're performers who are giving uh, these large public performances to the Mysorean community. Uh, following the cutting back of their allowances, and they're they're obviously outraged about this, and and I think that that's that's a huge con uh, 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 contribution to what what happened at Valor, and people just simply have been incapable of seeing it. Um, yeah, there is uh, some additional re information regarding. Uh, the Roots of Women of Tipu. This is by uh, Dr. Vijay Ponacha. He's professor in Canada University. Uh, he's saying that uh, some of them were forcefully taken from Kurg, Malabar, and Kendra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, if you look at uh, the East India Company records, including the 1800 report by Thomas Marriott, uh, he talks about how these women were forcibly removed from their homes. Um, and, um, I'm, well, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe they were, but it seems to me indicative of a British colonial report um, about these women, that they wanted to troll Tipu Sultan as an oriental despot in order to justify um, his, his murder. Um, and so putting, uh, describing these women as victims uh, was part of their agenda. But I'm sure there are other sources that talk about uh, uh, where these women come from out beyond the colonial archives and published sources. I, I, I just don't know of them. Uh, another question from uh, Professor Ashok. In what language did the women communicate with EAC officers? <laughs> well, they, they communicated in a lot of different languages, it seems, which is why Thomas Marriott was hired, because um, it appears that he knew uh, Persian, he'd studied Arabic, he, uh, he knew Tamil, and um, he, he lived in Madras, so he knew Tamil. Um, and I'm, I guess he knew Canada as well. Um, so it was because of his uh, language talents that he was brought in to, um, uh, to deal with the women of Tipu Sultan's court, who it appears came from a very, very broad range of language backgrounds. I, I don't know what language they spoke amongst themselves in the court, but presumably the higher ranking women would have communicated in Persian I mean, some of them were Mughal women, uh, the, the actual wives of uh, Tipu and Haider. Some of them were uh, from uh, Mughal courts. Uh, another question from uh, Gareth Sandam. Uh, would Henrietta Clive have been involved or consulted in the decision of how the ladies of Vellore would be treated following the fall of Seringapatnam? I don't think so. Uh, Henrietta Clive fascinates me because um, her, her husband, Edward Clive, who of course was the son of Robert Clive, um, he, you know, he came from a very privileged family and for that reason he became the, uh, the governor of Madras. Um, but it, it seems to me that Henrietta Clive was, um, oh, how should I put this? Um, she was a bit more astute than her husband and she kept this diary um, and 
I'm not even sure that she went to Sri Rangapatnam. I, I don't know if she actually saw the conditions that the women lived in in Sri Rangapatnam before they were moved to Vellore. I found no evidence of that. Um, so she comes to Vellore, she sees the apartments, and, and it seems she just takes it as given that this new accommodation is a vast improvement on uh, what, they, what they used to live in. Yeah, these are the questions uh, we have already raised. If anybody uh, have a question, please, if you want to ask orally, please uh, unmute yourself, introduce your, yourself and ask the question, please. If anybody want to ask question orally, please unmute yourself, introduce and ask the question. There is one question appeared in chat box again by Ashok. Uh, this uh, were such arrangements made for women of another uh, women of other defeated kings. This is his question regarding well, in what what language uh, did the women communicate with the EAC, EAC officers? Um, I I don't know exactly what languages they communicated. Um, to the officers in, but as, as I mentioned before, one of the reasons that Thomas Marriott was appointed was definitely because he spoke several uh, uh, Indian languages. Um, but um, sorry, what the, the, the other, oh yes, the other question was about whether the British did this to any other um, kingdoms. And um, I don't think they did anything comparable to what they did at Sri Rangapatnam anywhere else. I mean, they, they did some pretty lousy things um, elsewhere. I guess the first regicide that the East India Company committed must have been uh, the uh, uh, in, in Bengal um, with, uh, was it Siraj Uddullah? Um, and then Tipu Sultan was the next regicide that they uh, committed. But of course, the difference with Bengal was um, after the, uh, the killing of Siraj Abdullah, he was replaced by, um, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. He was replaced by the general who had uh, sort of on the sly helped Robert Clive to win at the Battle of Plassey. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, but I, it seems to me that what the East India Company was doing over there was pretty ad hoc, um, and no one incident is the same. Mr. Ashok is uh, posing another question related to this question only. Uh, was this unique to Tipu's female entourage? And so why this special treatment for these women? Yes, that's a good question. I think it partially has to do with Orientalist discourse in around 1800, that here you have uh, this young man, Thomas Marriott, who is, he's been educated at Fort William and at Fort St. George. Um, he was, it appears he was with the two hostage sons of Tipu Sultan at, uh, at Madras before uh, the, the Fourth Mysore War. Um, and he, um, he comes from a family that is connected with Warren Hastings, who of course was a great patron of Orientalist scholarship. Um, and, uh, you know, his, his parents are friends with, um, Warren and Marion Hastings back in, in, uh, in England and are writing letters about, um, what he's doing. And, um, you know, quite excitedly as well, they think this is a fantastic opportunity for him, you know, as, as an Orientalist scholar. Um, we also know that Thomas Marriott uh, at Sri Rangapatnam, he, um, he worked alongside um, 
some, uh, he met some Shia um, scholars there who helped him to translate uh, Arabic uh, legal treatises, uh, which he then, which Marriott then used to help guide his decisions on uh, the treatment of the, of the women um, of uh, Tipu Sultan's uh, entourage. So there, there's a lot of really complicated stuff happening there. And I think there is this sense of, um, certainly under the governor generalship of uh, Richard Wellesley, that they're just, they're spending a lot of money and you know, they're, um, they're really interested in these different projects. You know, they're building government house in uh, Calcutta and, um, and in Madras as well. Um, and they're, they're doing these very strange things with, you know, working out how to reorganize an entire kingdom in Madras, which is incredibly far away from uh, where the rest of the territories that they're, um, uh, they're based at. Um, yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just doing all kinds of strange things in around 1800 that they stopped doing a decade or two later. Um, uh, Victor Vaz, uh, he's teaching English in uh, uh, Mangalore University. He's asking a question. Could you please infer to us how we would place him in the contemporary scheme of gender? Sorry, can you say that again? Could you please infer to us how we would place him in the contemporary scheme of gender, Tipu Sultan? Oh, I... I don't know. I mean, honestly, I'm I'm less interested in Tipu Sultan and more interested in the East India Company. Um, so my my paper is more about um, what the East India Company did uh, with these women. Um, I can't really comment on Tipu Sultan, um, and I I wouldn't want to compare something uh, the way women were treated 200 plus years ago in any part of the world with. Uh, with what, how, how they're treated today. Okay. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Anand Narayanappa. Being a woman, how do you think about Tipu's women who were confined in one place and deprived of the fundamental rights? <laughs> well, I, I suppose for me, it was just... It, it was really interesting to, to find these letters. It was, it was the letters about the move from Sri Rangapatnam to Velour that really got me interested in this research project because it just, it seemed to me that these women were, they were making the British run around in circles. They didn't know what was going on. Um, and it, it just kind of, it, it made me laugh really. I, I, I could just sort of imagine these hapless, Brits trying to do what they thought was going to be, you know, a very straightforward operation, you know, moving these women from one location to another. And they end up completely baffled and um, letting, letting these women have their own way because um, they just, they just don't know how else to deal with them. Uh. Another question from Dr. Lalitamba. Is it because Mysore kings were not ready to take care of these women? Um, well, I think you have to remember that the, so the, the new Wodeyar king of Mysore is a five-year-old child and he's a Hindu. So um, they, you know, they're very different courts. On the other hand, the in the Treaty of Mysore, the East India Company is hitting up the Wodeyar Kingdom of Mysore for the money to support the women of Tipu Sultan's court in Velour Fort. So they are indirectly supporting uh, Tipu's female entourage because the East India Company tells them to. Um, uh... Uh, there is a uh, you know question from Lucy from Ambrose College UK. She's asking, uh, uh, your paper is available uh, in JSTOR uh, to read. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. it came out in early December. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we have raised our most questions in the chat box. If anybody have questions and uh, want to ask orally, please raise your question after unmuting the mic, please. Otherwise, we will wind up the session. If anybody has question, please unmute yourself and Ma'am, again, uh, one more question I have. I'm Lali Tamba. Uh, Ma'am, you told that um, uh, these uh, company people were insisting on uh, Mysore Vodayas to cater to the needs of uh, these women who are in Velour. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, records of that? How much money these Mysore uh, kings really spent on that and other things? Not at my fingertips, but um, there is, I have seen information um, about this. Um, there's a book, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to remember, oh, uh, Sal Salmon, Solomon, Salmon, I can't remember, um, that contains appendices, which are all about um, the, the money that the, the Wodeyars are being charged for the maintenance of uh, Tipu's uh, family. Um, I mean, it was, yeah, it was part and parcel with um, the starting up of, of, of uh, the Wodeyar kingdom. You know, the East India Company was also hitting them up for um, protection money uh, to supply them with an army, for example. But yes, I have seen this information and I, I could send you a reference if you if you like. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, a few minutes more. If anybody want to raise question, please unmute. Ma'am, you told that uh, many women who were learned uh, in Vellur, they have uh, written some uh, letters or uh, their opinions about going back to their uh, families. Uh, can we get uh, uh, those uh, records? Is it in the library, British Library? The letters which the learned women uh, in uh, uh, Vellur uh, who have written uh, their opinions about going back to their uh, homes. So are we talking about women at Vellore going back to Sri Rangapatnam or going to Calcutta to be with their sons? Going well, back to their original families, actually. Because uh, oh, you told yes. Oh, yes, from 1800. Um, no, not, not really. Um, and actually, the um, a lot of the women who left the, uh, the court after 1800 and before the move in 1802 were simply um, taken as uh, servants or slaves by uh, Tipu Sultan's adult sons, it appears. Okay. Um, they just kind of helped, their self, helped themselves to the, the best um, servants. And, um, and then of course there were also deaths um, some of the women left uh, that way. They were elderly people who passed away. Okay. Uh, may I? Yeah, please, Patabi. Uh, Professor Patabi from Mangalore is having a question. Please, Patabi, sir. Ah, it was a very uh, articulate uh, presentation. I was very Thank happy you. about it. Mm, it was, uh, you did not hear from your uh, topic, but I, I am trying to drag you into another thing, which is 
this uh, great Kannada and Tamil poet and a translator who founded the South Asian Studies Center in Chicago uh, called A.K. Ramarjan. <clears throat> he found in the British archives Tipu's uh, dream, uh, a diary of Tipu's dreams. Yes. Which, which, which led to two uh, uh, very famous uh, Kannada dramas. Girish Karnad wrote one and uh, Kambar wrote another. So, I mean, uh, and uh, uh, does this, I mean, uh, your, your uh, investigation of these things, does it throw some light on how he, um, how Tipo Sultan, um, I mean, uh, uh, envisaged, envisioned women, women in general. No, it is, I, uh, I, I know this is a question which is, okay, yes. Okay. I, I mean, I, I know that such sources exist in London. Um, I, one of my former colleagues at the British Library, Ursula Sims Williams has written about um, the uh, 600 or so uh, manuscripts from Tipu Sultan's private library, which are now in the British Library in London. And one of them is uh, this book of dreams or a, a version of it. Um, and then I also know about uh, Josh Ehrlich, um, who has written about the uh, also about the manuscripts of, of Tipu Sultan, both in um, Kolkata and in London? And um, but I haven't. I'm not. I'm not a Persian scholar. I'm not really a languages person. I've I've only I've limited myself to English language um, documentation uh, by the East India Company. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bit. I, I don't know about uh, I don't know about that that area. Uh, I'm taking the last question of the this session that uh, uh, that's by Nidin Olekara. What further work do you plan to do on this subject? Uh, well, um, I'm signed up to give a. Uh, paper at a conference in, uh, at the University of Bonn in uh, October, uh, which hopefully will happen. I, I had, I, like all of you, I suppose, I had many conferences I've wanted to attend over the last 12 months and they've all been canceled. Um, it, um, yeah, so there's a conference in October that I'm going to attend, which is, uh, it's about, uh, gender and slavery, and uh, I'm I'm going to be looking at the women of Tipu Sultan's court uh, within that context, um, and in particular at their treatment by the East India Company and and how it changes um, that towards the end of their uh, their lives. Uh, t by the time uh, you reach the the mid 19th century. And there are very few women left by then, um, but those women are treated uh, as as prisoners rather than um, courtiers of Tipu Sultan. Yeah, we have uh, finished and done with this uh, session, uh, and we have raised almost uh, questions in chat box, and uh, people also asked questions orally. Uh, Lalita Mamanu, do you have any question? We are, uh... yes, sir, I just wanted to thank you. Okay, Adam. okay, Such okay. A really wonderful session, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, thank you very much. Uh, so with this, uh, we are ending the session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer House, for making time and space uh, uh, to address us and you know, uh, also discursively engage in the question and answer session. 
uh, we hope Thank that you. Uh, there will be you know uh, you will be there uh, in karnataka for uh, physical appearance and uh, you talk uh, to us or talk among us uh, elaborately elaborately on this uh, issue uh, so i personally and collectively thank on behalf of uh, bengaluru historian society dr sk aruni who is representing and uh, uh, on behalf of itihasa darpana uh, dr rajesh is uh, representing and uh, rutumana.com another forum uh, mr nitish kuntadi and team is representing and i also uh, uh, express my sincere thanks to you on behalf of the great friendly audience uh, always uh, they engage uh, themselves uh, in the presentation and uh, you know they are actively participate in the question and answer uh, so again uh, once again i thank uh, on behalf of everybody to jennifer house Uh, and i wish uh, best for jennifer house in uh, further you know projects and uh, you know programs also thank you very much jennifer house thank you thank you for inviting me it's been a real pleasure thank you so much